All right, great. Everybody here, I'm going to do Malta Malta at Cornell University. I want to tell you a little story about Malta. How I actually met Malta. I was in the Oscar community, and I, was, I do research on teamwork of robots, on the vehicles, and a team. And he does the same thing, pretty much, right? And, and at the time, I didn't know him, but I know we were you know, heading in the same circles, all right? And then we interviewed Walter for a job. What Walter? Walter. For a job. And then Walter was talking during the interviewing process. And I mentioned some of the things I was doing. He said, well, a friend of mine at Cornell that does the same thing, I'm Malta. And at the next conference, I'll, I'll you know, introduce it to him. And at the next conference, he did that. And we became friends. And we see each other all the time. And we you know, co-see in areas. So it's kind of funny how that works out. Right? Small yeah. world. I mean, small <laughs> world. I think that finds research very interesting and very enjoyable. So I'll, I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. It's really great to great to be here. And it's just been a long time I, uh, since I've been in in, in Arbor. I was say one, one time I did an internship in Detroit in 2003. That was at the time I was still probably in mechanical engineering and in manufacturing. Was working as a in project management for for uh, General Motors um, production line for for cylinder head uh, for, for for motor, motor box. Yeah. <laughs> so it shifted quite a bit since uh, since 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 then into into teamwork and and robots. But then kind of a really core focus of of my work is really on 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 teams. And and I want to start start with that. So I I, I want to show you uh, a video of uh, of an of an engineering team. Two engineers in a debriefing meeting. Um, and uh, those, those two people have been working on an optical system for NASA, NASA's gravity probe, probe B experiment. And this is a, t a 20 second interaction. I want you to just have a look and see how that, how that goes. Let's see. Can you look at the drawings? I have most of them in there. Right. Now, there's All just right. like two, drawing, two drawings that we're missing. Well, we can say, well, what do we need about that? And how, how can we like, get that part? What made right. these design decisions in NASA? about everyone about each part. Right. And that could be really positive and very very constructive and a useful positive way of ending this sort of negative spiraling out of control scenario. <laughs> Some of you have probably seen the video <laughs> you've seen it already. So I, so I mean you can see this is not going very well and I'm I'm pretty sure you have more or less all been in situations like like this. And a lot of my early work was trying trying to understand about uh, about like for, for, for one thing, how do these kinds of interactions, uh, how do they relate to the performance of a team? Can we, can we tell about whether how people are interacting in a team, how that affects performance, and if a team like this might, uh, what they will deliver? But also, I mean, um, teams don't start out like this. Like, how do they get there? Why do some teams uh, end in conflict like this one? And uh, what are the processes, what are the steps? And then also the question about who we tell very early on. And my, my early work was really trying to, to, to understand, understand those kinds of questions. And, and there's a ton of literature on conflict and emotions on, in teams and more the organizational behavior space. But for me, the, the breakthrough came by looking at a completely different domain and area of, of work. And I want to show you another video that's coming from that line of, line of work. It's another 20 seconds of interaction between two people. And I also like to like you just look at it and look at the the similarities between between this one and the next video I'll show. You know, I try not to drive. Well, I think that's um, probably the best. When I was driving, I was doing all those presentations. Yeah. Turn of the year, I was trying to finish three, you know, multi-million okay, dollar I, contracts. You know what? Probably, was, you know, you know, okay, fine. I, so this I, is what I do. So you, you get all upset and I say, well, you know what? I've got X well, amount to do in this amount of time. What? This is this is a, a not an engineering team. This is a, a, a married couple, or <laughs> still married at this point, this point in time. And uh, the the video is coming from a series of studies by by uh, John Gottman, who in the 90s kind of brought brought these uh, married couples into his into his laboratory, asked them to sit on two chairs opposite of each other, and videotaped them while they were discussing. Some some problem or some conflict issue in their marriage, uh, uh, and then he recorded them for 15 minutes, and that's where this kind of the video came from. And then he developed a way to classify people's emotional expressions, and based on that data, he could build predictive models of divorce. And in one study that was particularly famous, he he was able to show that uh, 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 that that um, 
Um, divorce could be predicted 14 years out with 93% accuracy from just the emotional expressions in a 15-minute video like that. And, and that, for me, led me to the question during my PhD to pursue, um, if this works with couples, does it work with engineering teams? And, and so my dissertation, in the end, was about this idea that, yes, the same patterns that distinguish between functional and dysfunctional marriages also distinguished between, between functional and dysfunctional, high and low performance engineering teams. And, uh, and I just want to give a quick glimpse. There's, there's two key patterns that I focus on um, that were these predictors of marital satisfaction and divorce that, uh, that, that found some evidence that they seem to carry over into team teams. And the first one is this idea of affective balance. Um, this idea that when we look at emotion in interaction, what's a lot more informative uh, uh, is, 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 or what's most informative is to look at the balance between positive and negative affect rather than positive or negative affect in isolation. There's a ton of studies on emotion and teamwork, but most of the time they focus on either just the amount of positivity and negativity. And what the couples research found is that um, their base rates in isolation are really not, don't give us as much insight into a, the quality of an interaction than how they stand in relationship to each other. And a, and a key way to operationalize that balance that I got excited about at the time were these, these point graphs. And here's some examples from the couples research. Each of these graphs uh, presented, represent a different, different couple. And each line represents like, either the husband or the wife. And the way they're plotted is that you take the cumulative sum of, of positive minus negative affect over time. So you take a unit of time and say, a speaker turn or a minute of, of, of talk, you count all the positive expression uh, and subtract the number of negative expression, you come up with the data point, you do that for the next segment of time, and you add those up. And so if you have a graph like this that goes downhill, that more or less means every time someone opened their mouth, there was always more negativity in it than positivity. That's why it goes downhill. And, and here on average, things have more uh, positivity in it than negativity. So you have this kind of nice stock market exchange view of an interaction that gives you a sense about how the interaction is going. And the slope of these point graphs was a, was a key predictor of divorce. Kind of whether they went up or down really told you, told you uh, a lot. And one aspect that I'll get back to you later is that on the theory side is uh, um, what, what people have been arguing in that literature on conflict and generally emotion and marital interaction, that the key mechanism uh, for functional relationships is this ability to, to regulate emotions in such a way that you're able to produce more positive than negative affect consistently and that you prevent negativity from escalating. So it's those really interesting points like this one, to understand what happens here when things went downhill, what is it, what's, what are these abilities and, and, and behaviors that enable the couple to turn around and, and, and change things from escalating uh, uh, further. And sort of one of the studies which was, uh, was, what I did was to look at, for example, exactly these patterns in pair programming teams. And so we had a lab study with people working on a programming task for five to eight hours. We took the first five minutes of an interaction um, and encoded it in the, in the same way they've done in a couple, and then uh, found these same patterns. We found some of the programming teams had the upward slope, some other ones the downward slope, and we found that that was predictive of, of, uh, of outcomes. So, for example, the upward slope programming teams turn out to be significantly more satisfied with their programming experience, but what was really nice to see was also that they developed significantly better codes. So that was scored on an objective uh, um, a scoring system and the uh, upward slope programmers developed a code that got twice as many points as the, the downward slope ones. Um, another, another kind of key pattern of, 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 uh, of divorce, a predictor, was this idea that there are certain behaviors that are particularly uh, hostile and corrosive to an interaction. Um, there were four, they singled out, I think they were uh, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling, belligerence, I, I think. And they were so corrosive that they labeled them or referred to them as the four horsemen of the, of the uh, uh, apocalypse. And, uh, and 
in another study, kind of, that also partially uh, replicated the, the affective balance idea, but here I want to focus on this hostile affect idea. We, we looked at these engineering teams in a, in a, in a, a larger engineering class, tracked them over, over nine, nine months, and videotaped them with that sort of adaptive procedure from the couples conflict studies where we brought these teams in a lab, engaged them in a conflict for 15 minutes, video recorded them, and then coded these interactions. And this is just a sense how they look like and uh, gives you a sense of the level of analysis we did there. These are the codes that you see on the bottom of the person on the upper left. I didn't understand that as a concept, it's definitely key. But in terms of like XP, how important is it? Well, we can probably simplify our lives but not Putting a motorized door, not putting a cleaning mechanism, yeah, not putting right. that little sub door. We're not getting rid of Yeah, I don't want to do that. So the core here was really kind of a moment-to-moment a, a, a -moment microanalysis of people's expressions over 15 minutes in January, and then we wanted to compare that against um, the, the performance at the end, at the end of the semester, five, five to six months later. And the one data point, it's a small, from a small subset of the data that I wanted to show you is this one. Where we, where we tracked, counted the number of, of, of these four horsemen emotions expressed during the 15 minute in January and plotted it against, against the, uh, the score each team received five months later for their physical hardware they developed uh, and, and, and delivered at the end of, end of the class. And even though this was a small data set, this was kind of still a nice evidence to see that suggests this kind of that there's these hostile expressions might not only tell us something about couples, but also maybe quite a bit about, about, about engineering teams. And so against that, that, uh, that background of these moment-to-moment -moment interaction dynamics, I'm really curious about, about robots. As we bring them more and more into teams, what do they do with these moment-to-moment -moment dynamics? I mean, here is like a... In, in, in robots, we get them into more and more teamwork context. This is one of the oldest ones, sort of um, disaster response, where robots have been, been teleoperated, robots have been uh, used from very, very early on. They used more and more in, in medical context. Like here is an example of the Da Vinci surgical robot being used, being used in, the, in the OR. I need to know why that looks very still futuristic. I mean, in, a few years ago, they did more than half a million surgeries. Uh, uh, a year in the U.S. alone with that with that uh, with that machine, but like even beyond teleoperated robots, we get more and more autonomous systems like here in manufacturing settings where they are embedded in 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 groups, and also with with uh, also artificial agent systems like here. If you've seen Google Allo, where I have an artificial assistant embedded in a messenger that will. A kind of in some way affect how we how we communicate with with uh, with each other. So, in a in a in a broad sense, I'm I'm interested in sort of the intersection of of teamwork robots and with a particular focus on emotion and these interpersonal emotional emotional dynamics. And so broadly to understand about. When we bring a robot, when we bring robot into teamwork and group settings, how does it mess with these interpersonal emotional dynamics? And, uh, and on the other hand, can we use robots to, to positively influence these dynamics to, bet, to get better group work, group work outcomes? And, and today I want to talk about two studies that focus more on the second questions, like this idea about how we, how we might use a robot to, to uh, support teamwork, not by acting and helping with the task the team is working on, but by supporting the social dynamics of a team and hoping that that will lead the team to produce, to produce uh, better outcomes. We also do work in my lab on studying more the first question. Like we go in the field and study, for example, robotic surgery and understanding by comparing laparoscopic and open surgery. What does this robot actually do to the way people, people interact in the team? But, but uh, uh, I'll focus on this kind of intervention question. And um, when we when we uh, look at look at emotion uh, in in HRI, usually that that or think about emotion in HRI, usually this 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 idea of of, of these expressive expressive robots uh, come up. And here's kind of pretty much sort of 
the first one that stands for that work, that's uh, Cynthia Brazil's Kiss Met Go Wild, so this first uh, emotionally expressive, expressive uh, robot. And, and, but more broadly, the research on, on emotion expression uh, in HRI, I think, follows more this, this idea of a signaling paradigm. The idea that, that, uh, that the emotion expression is a way for people to, to learn something or, or get to know uh, or make inferences about the robot's internal, uh, internal, internal state. And so there is this idea that goes with that of a focus on the expression and that the emotion is sort of the expression and that there is a congruency between the robot's internal state, the, the, the sort of behavioral features of the expression, how that expression will be interpreted, and how it'll make the observer, how the, uh, it'll make the observer, observer feel. And, and of course, then in line with that, a lot of the work in HRI focuses on this idea of, of, of uh, building robots in that area that express emotions and then validating whether people can correctly identify and classify a set of, set of uh, expression that a robot uh, makes. And, and in a recent survey that we, that we just completed, we found that 89% of the HRI papers that deal with emotion expression at the HRI conference really subscribe to this idea that the, that the expression itself is what defines its interpretation and, and, and how it will be, be perceived in the moment. But when I've been looking at, at, at robots and human-robot interaction, I found that uh, that is often not the case. That, that I want to challenge that idea that the expression itself tells us how it will be, how it will be uh, Interpret it, and and that we should go away from a from a view on emotion that focuses on on, on emotion on, on the sort of expressive features of a robot. And I want to show you an example. It's a little video I got from uh, one of Julie Shah's at the time postdocs, uh, Bradley Hayes, who's now starting at Boulder, already started, and and he's building these robots that can collaborate, uh, building this AI, uh, uh, artificial intelligence systems that allow robots like, like this small version of an industrial robot to collaborate with people on, on, on complex, complex tasks. So this is a robot where a participant has to build a circuit. Uh, the robot has a, has, a, has a model and a task structure of how the circuit can be assembled. And based on the, on the participant's behavior, the robot makes predictions about what parts the participant might, might use, and the robot gives those parts to the participants at the right moment, moment in time to support the task. But sometimes, kind of, they found that there are some behaviors that the AI spit out that kind of were surprising to them. I'll show you this 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 video. It's kind of just five seconds. So in this, in this sense, they found that often when this happened, the participants like reacted really, really startled that the robot comes and takes away a, uh, um, a part. And this is like makes sense from the app perspective. The part is probably not likely to be used, so put it further away. But like at the same time, kind of, if I come and, 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 and take, your, take your burrito and put it away, that also tells like, okay, maybe, yeah, okay, you shouldn't eat anymore. You had, you had enough. So, so there is. And, and an emotional communicative aspect in that, that uh, patronizing uh, aspect of that. And, and, and there's a robot, it just does pick and place. There's nothing inherent in this move, move motion that we would look at it as, as, uh, as emotionally significant, yet it has sort of that communicative <coughs> aspect. Here. And, 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 and similarly, uh, here's another example that actually got me interested early on in HRI. This is a video from a study out of Cynthia Brazil's group, from a study by, by Nick De Palma, who used a crowdsourced a, uh, uh, AI, and they tested it in a, in a search game with participants at the museum. And I found that there were several of these interactions like this one, where a participant tried to in, engage with the robot in some way, and then this happened. Drives away, and similarly here, I mean, 
there's no inherent inherent affect in this idea of turning around and driving away. But like if you're trying to engage with someone and that person just turns around and goes away, that can come across as fairly, fairly, um, fairly offensive. And so kind of that more and more kind of pose these questions about to look at emotions sort of not as located within within the expression itself and and, and maybe the sort of pixel-like lamp expressive motion of the robot but sort of in the interaction itself and in the sort of contingencies between between two people engaging with with each other and and sort of to capture uh, that perspective uh, on on emotion we try to 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 develop this idea of what we call affective 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 grounding <coughs> that situates uh, emotion as something that happens happens between people in the interaction rather than in the expression sort of on top of, of people. And the core, um, the core idea here is, is uh, kind of we're trying to draw from a similar argument like, like building on Herb Clark's work on, on, on grounding. And at the time, he kind of wanted to go away from that idea of communication from that Shannon and Weaver sender message receiver, receiver model and, 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 and argue that uh, communication is a, is a collaborative activity. And similarly, I think emotion expression right now in HRI particularly, but also beyond that, follows broadly this sender message receiver model that we have the expression and that kind of gets across and the other person perceives that and, and, and all is done. But, but I think it's actually uh, useful to think of emotion and interaction also as a collaborative activity and to think that people when they when they are in interaction and com communicate with other not just have to coordinate and process some content like Clark proposed but but also uh, but also on, on affect and engage in this process where where the the the, the, the meaning of of, uh, of 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 an of a behavior or its emotional meaning has to be established collaboratively I and mean, you might and even here in a group, we might talk, and I think uh, maybe I like I might tell a tell a tell a tell a joke. No one's laughing, and kind of, and you have this juggling back and forth. And if I'm interested in sort of that, what's that dance that goes out, goes goes on for for people to to figure out how they relate to each other, how you interpret behavior, what people do when someone misunderstood you or says something offensive, and figuring out was it really meant that way, was it not? And, and I think this idea of, of effective grounding, are kind of that's what I'm trying to develop to, to capture capture those um, those processes. And I'm curious about like how could uh, uh, how can we use that perspective to understand sort of interactions with robots uh, in, um, in in their emotional impact, but also about opportunities. How can robots engage in that social? Kind of meaning, meaning, making, making, making um, um, process, um, and so I want to talk about about two, two, uh, two concrete, concrete studies. So this is the first one that really tried to uh, kind of also building on this idea that in, in, in grounding uh, there's a, a lot of work on 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 repair, and which means in that context, kind of how do we re repair um, sort of the, 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 the kind of established shared understanding about about the content in an, in, uh, an, an interaction and, and repair, for example, uh, like a, a form of repair. It's like if you say something to me and I don't understand it, I, I, I ask a question and then you have a, have an opportunity to, to 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 correct. And I'm interested here in sort of it's more <coughs> looking at at uh, repair from an emotional perspective, kind of to see. To look at the way if like an interaction goes downhill, like one of these point graphs, how can I repair it and to turn, turn things around? And so here's an example in a in a group interaction. Well, see two people, people the two here are, are having an argument, and at some point she tries to uh, intervene and says something like, tries to put his voice more out saying, What if he wants to tell us something? And uh, in this case the repair doesn't work, she's ignored, but this is sort of the kind of behaviors we're interested in. Let me show you that. Why I didn't do it Saturday. We don't, we just, we don't, I don't think excuses are a good idea. Well, I, I feel like it would be helpful for this discussion. Us. I don't. You
So this, these are these kind of moments that sort of prompted this study, and, and, and it's like, and if I brought this graph again, it's like that would have been an opportunity here, here maybe to turn things around. It didn't, it didn't work. But we wanted to see, would a, would a robot have a possibility to do something useful um, in, this, in a moment of, of, of conflict to change sort of these temporal dynamics of an interaction? So we did a study uh, with uh, a laboratory study with three people and, and a remote uh, Wizard of Oz controlled robot. And those three people uh, um, engaged in a, in a problem, problem, solving, problem solving task. And one of the three people, this one, was a, was a uh, confederate. And, and uh, the confederate was instructed at some point to say something like, uh, uh, you, you, you're, you're stupid. You're an idiot. You can you can do this, and and we wanted we wanted to see okay what does that do to the interaction, and is there something a robot could do to to mitigate the negative uh, impact of such such a vi violation. To, for for the study, we um, we used the, the problem people focus on was a modified version of the master mastermind game. Are you familiar with this? It's sort of a code tracking game. It's an old one where if, if I would play against you, I would see these four pins. I, I pick an arbitrary code, and you have to guess what it is. And you would do this by, by placing these, these pins as an example in the first row, maybe the two yellow and the two blue ones. And then I give you feedback through these red or, yellow or white pins about how, how how correct you are. I think a, a white pin means that that you got uh, one pin in the right color, that would be the blue one. And if I place a red pin, that would mean you got one pin in the right color and in the right position, that would be this red one here. So you get give people feedback and you would have to strategize about getting in a limited number of rounds at the right, at the right solution. And uh, that task has been used in HRI studies before. <laughs> And because this was a grant on uh, uh, also disaster response, we disguised it as a bomb diffusal task, where, <laughs> where, the, where the, the, the pins became, became uh, wires, and sort of the correct combination was the way to diffuse the bomb, and then we could, could have a timer, which made everything also a little bit more, 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 more engaging. And so the task of the participants was to, to place these wires, and then the robot's role in this end, in the end was there to help people get to the right solution by giving them that kind of feedback. feedback. And, um, and I'll show you how this works. So people place the wires, and then they ask the robot to, to scan. Scan now. Scan. So and then the robot moved around a little bit, and at some point, I sense two current flows. I sense two charged wires. So the, the current flow and charged wire was code for these white and red red pins, and then people could strategize about okay, how did they make their next move? And and this whole interaction with the robot to wave around took actually 30 seconds to to complete, and that was deliberately so that that it would incur a high cost. Uh, for, for, for the participants to ask the robot to scan because they had 10 minutes of time and we didn't want them to just place wires and scan, place wires and scan. We wanted them to deliberate and discuss. Uh, and, and, uh, and the 30 second long scanning procedure prevented you from kind of doing this all, all the time. So in the study, <coughs> we had, we had four, four conditions. It was a two by two, two design, our main manipulation, <coughs> was the, whether the robot would, would uh, yeah, re repair or, or not repair, or, or follow, follow the violation of the confederate with the, with the repair statement. And, and, uh, and then we, we, we manipulated the, the nature of the violation. In one half of the, the participants, the confederate has said something, attacking the person directly, saying, like, you're stupid. And, and the task violation was saying something like where the confederate just said, okay, let's not use this wire, let's use another. <coughs> and, uh, and our key kind of measures were task performance and, and, uh, and uh, conflict. We measured, measured perceptions of conflict within the team with carrying games sort of uh, um, intra-group conflict, conflict, conflicts, uh, conflicts uh, scale. And, 
And we expected originally that that uh, that was sort of our intention that perceptions of conflict would go would go down, but instead we found we found the opposite. So um, to to read this, um, when the when the robot, these are the dark bars, uh, when the Confederate expressed a personal attack, like you're you're stupid, um, conflict perception actually went up significantly when the robot repaired it and um, when the robot repair, repair it after. So people, people in the group perceived there to be more conflict between team members when the same statement was repaired by a robot than, uh, than when it was not. So in, in, in hindsight, kind of, it, made, it made sense to us because like we noticed when, and I'll show you a quick video in a second, when uh, the Confederate made the statement like you're stupid, there's a lot of nervous tension within the group and kind of you can see people try to try to actually brush it under the table, and I think, okay, that didn't happen, I'm just ignoring it, it's too awkward to even address this. And, and then the robot saying, kind of making, making a statement addressing that, ha had um, brought it out in the open, and the groups had to deal with it and, and acknowledge it, and that kind of uh, uh, turned, uh, turned, up, uh, turned up here. And so, so it was really kind of the, what we saw here was really the reaction to the violation. It was when we had like, not the, uh, not, the, not the robot's response in itself. Because when the robot responded with the, with the same repair statement after just a task violation, perceptions of conflict didn't, didn't change. So that was really that sort of interaction between the, the personal attack and then the robot um, putting, it, putting it out in front of people. And we had like the repair statement by the robot went through several prototypes, and in the end was something where the robot said, whoa, uh, dude, that was, that was inappropriate, and then followed by a normative statement, let's, let's stay positive. And this kind of uh, response was deliberately designed to be a kind of not kind of be expectable for, for a robot, particularly one that did not look humanoid in, in any sense, because we wanted people to the most important thing was we wanted people to notice it, and we noticed in piloting that a lot of people laugh when a robot says something like this, so we thought, okay, the humor in Aaron in that could additionally help. But I'll, I'll show you a video to give us, get a sense of how this, how this looked like. It's like a one minute or so. You should do that, because I'm not going to know what... I was going to say, maybe George ran around. We're staying positive. Scan now. <laughs> 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 Scan now. No, you're, you're stupid. It's not going to work. Just what we're going to do. Whoa. Man, that was inappropriate. <laughs> Let's stay positive. <laughs> so which one should we... I mean... What if we just... It's just slow, too slow. I'm going to start doing something. Dude, what the heck? Stand out. That's too positive. study like took so much time everybody was like no never look at this thing again. <laughs> but uh, yeah I think this would be still a nice thing I said to to uh, to dig into um, but uh, yeah kind of building on this work and I'm thinking about how robots can can sort of support facilitation of conflict one thing kind of uh, we we were focusing on here sort of this idea that a lot of the, the our conflict management management abilities and skills we learn at a very young age. And so here I want to talk briefly about a study that, that we recently completed that focused on this idea about whether a robot can help young children um, um, develop better better conflict management uh, uh, management skills. So in the in the 
in the case of, of, of the study, we looked at conflict sort of in the context of object possession disputes. So define it like such that one child's opposition to satisfy another child's explicitly expressed goal, desire, objective, involving the possession and or use of one more pieces of physical objects. More or less like one kid wants to have one toy that the other one has. And, and, and if they resist that, then we define it as a conflict. And so this study was led by my postdoc, Solis Shen, and she spent a tremendous amount of work really developing a new sort of conflict solicit uh, elicitation paradigm for children and getting out and developing the interaction paradigm for the robot, finding kids to work with. And um, we just finally uh, completed the interaction. It was a huge, huge effort. And it's fun to finally be able to talk about it. So the, the, the task uh, uh, she developed was around like, using all these, all these toys, like this one, Lego ice cream kit. But then the core idea was always we, we take all the waffle cones out. There's just one waffle cone left for two kids. And that inherently we find it's like, really good at, 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 uh, at creating conflict. But, but generally, also even in three to six year olds, that's the population we focus on, conflict is really uh, uh, happens very often. Like, I think in the literature, it's like five to ten conflicts per hour is completely typical in that age group. And, and also it's like just to just to state, like like we don't take the perspective uh, that it's important to avoid conflict. Like conflict is crucial, I think, not just for kids, also for, for adults and for teams to work well. But it's always about the question about uh, what really matters is how we engage in conflict. And this is what we wanted to focus on with 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 uh, with our robots. And, and what's also really cool about this study paradigm that Solis developed was that that even in the developmental psychology literature, as far as I understood it, most of the studies that focused on conflict were focused on use protocols that try to, with kids, to reflect about in a, a conflict. That rather than getting kids in a, in a, in a, in a context, an establishing a context where conflict would naturally occur that we can respond to, that I think was also a really novel, novel approach. And so we had basically, the study was very simple as a first try, just two conditions, uh, a mediation contrition and a control condition. That the idea that in the media con mediation contrition condition, the robot wants a conflict or uh, would occur, would follow and guide students through a sort of established uh, conflict, um, conflict uh, mitigation procedure that's, that's used in many educational settings that follows these six steps. Initially, we thought we'd do this, uh, this study kind of in, in context, so we reached out to several um, daycare centers and, 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 and schools and tried to uh, uh, do, this, do this right there. And we had 24 children in, 20, uh, 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 in 12, 12 first the pairs were all three to five years old randomly paired from the same class and engaged in a 20 minute play session. But kind of we found like after all these trials that that sort of setting there didn't, didn't work. First we found that the 20 minutes sort of what we got from the teachers was, was too short <coughs> to, to engage in the interactions we want and to elicit conflict. Also the problem was whenever a conflict occurred, the first to jump in was the teachers, so but we had no chance for our robot to, <laughs> to, to see if this is, is this any effective. And then we also found that sort of the established conflict mitigation uh, routine in these six steps was too long. It didn't, didn't work with kids. But they moved on much faster, so we needed to redesign that completely. So there's a lot of, lot of iteration and, and prototyping involved. And so in the end, we had a study that was done in the lab where we brought uh, 32 pairs, 64 kids overall, uh, um, into the lab. They were all three to six years old. They were randomly paired. Some of them were siblings, some of them were friends. And they engaged in a 15-minute play session. And Keepon was broadly introduced as uh, a mediator. And the conflict routine was more or less three steps. That Keepon played a whistle sign to indicate when there's a conflict. And, uh, and then Keepon asked the kids right away if there's a way for both of them to get what they want. And, uh, um, yeah, and this was overall an abbreviated version of this, this initial negotiation <coughs> procedure. And it was only used when the, the children could not solve the conflict on their own. So I'll show you how this looked like in one example. How kids kind of, uh, um, uh, one of these, these, these resource conflicts arose and then how the robot guide, uh, guided the kids through these interactions. 
in the in the mediation condition. It's a two-minute video. Then I'll just play if it was. how they were guided through the first time, but then often it happened that the next time kind of thing. Um, um, learned from that and took on some that behavior right away. So I just wanted to share this one, one, one finding. So overall, between the two conditions, we found that uh, people in the control conditions, the kids, children engaged overall in slightly more conflicts overall than the mediation <coughs> condition. That difference was not significant. But what was significant was sort of the difference in in, in, in how many of these conflicts ended up uh, getting, getting constructively, constructively resolved. That was 67% of all the conflict that, that happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the mediation condition were constructively resolved versus 18% in the control condition. And uh, so this was kind of just a, a nice initial pointer that yes, a robot can really have a, a play a really interesting and potentially of a role in, in, in really mediating and shaping how we engage in, in conflict. And so broadly, where this work is, 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 is going, kind of, it's sort of this idea that right now when we look at HRI as a, as a field, most of what we know about human-robot interaction is about the one-on-one -on -one interaction between human uh, and robot. We know a lot about the, 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 the psychology of this. Like, for example, we know how the Characteristics of the robot's behavior uh, and its and, and its like like uh, uh, embodiment features, how high it is, how it looks like, affects uh, how it is perceived, how people interact with it, and we know a lot about how to design good interactions that are pleasant and productive with a robot. But where we know a lot a lot less is about, and, and that's why I'm more interested in how how does a robot's behavior and its characteristics affect how people engage, engage with each other. And, and when we move that into the, into the group context, 
we know we know even even uh, um, even less like maybe just the the mere presence of a robot in the manufacturing floor affect how people interact with each other it doesn't even need to be his behavior does it does it change if I think that robot is installed by my boss by by an external client like would it change what I talk about with my uh, co-workers and even then uh, when we bring a robot in and, and, and it behaves in certain ways like that's what we're looking in in robotic surgery in these teleoperated uh, uh, contexts when you have the the, the, the head of the surgical team, the surgeon, uh, being hidden behind a console where they don't have access to all the sort of non verbal behaviors that are going, going on in the team. When there is a stress situation, that surgeon can't go to his team members, put their hand on their shoulder and calm them down. How does that, how does, how does that machine in that way affect and change the interpersonal dynamics? And, and so, and I think we, we don't really know much about that. And there's a huge space, and like as I showed at the beginning, we're putting these robots more and more into these team settings, and we have no clue what they do. And I want to, want to, want to conclude with, with the video that I found kind of thought-provoking that's coming from, from a, a company called Panamas AI. It's a promotional video for their social, for social robot. And I took out one snippet that I thought, it's interesting to put that in a promotional robot because it poses these really interesting questions. And, uh, and I think kind of it sets up the space is that, yeah, these robots are, will be there in, in all contexts, not just the, the specialized, the manufacturing floor and the, and the search and rescue and the, and the OR, but also maybe our everyday work environments. And I'll just play this video too. We plan to run a marketing campaign on the Upper East Side of New York. What do you think about that here? This neighborhood has a very promising outlook for this campaign, with 25,000 housing units. Also, 82% of people living there have a college degree. I think that's the right one for us. Sorry to interrupt, guys. Thomas has a lunch date with Chloe in 15 minutes. She just posted a bunch of photos on Facebook about her trip to New York. Thank you. <laughs> I find this kind of example interesting because it poses all these questions about like if a robot kind of takes place in decision making context, will we, why, why, why should we truly trust the robot? Like, does it have more influence than a person making the same suggestions? About how do we balance that out? How do you design for that? Also, this sort of privacy violation, what does it do to people's interpersonal dynamics? And, and, and I think there's a, just in this whole space now, there's so many interesting questions that we're just kind of starting to tap into them. So just to finalize this work, it's been done with an amazing group of students. I have like my postdocs, Solis Shen and Hamish Shannon, have done a lot of this work, and then my PhD students, Gabriel Culbertson, Houston Core, Jessica Holstein, and Sonia Paul. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. That's cool. In your, uh, that's probably not the right question, but like in the oh, kindergarten, <laughs> in the kindergarten mm -hmm. setting, um, like uh, isn't the first step to to see how a robot replacing a professional worker is like that that impact? But that didn't seem to be part of your study. And so then maybe a, a more interesting question then mm -hmm. is, what do you think would expect if we go into the themes that you described? And so we have like a daycare person, we have the two children, and we have a robot, like. Is that this seems to be one of the settings that you're extremely mm -hmm. interested in. Yeah. Um, so not with the idea of replacing the human, but maybe complementing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's good that you're addressing that, because maybe I didn't make that clear. Sort of the, our, our intention with the study is never sort of to, to re replace the page people in these, in these settings. More it's like this, this question about can we, can we augment it? Uh, in some way, can a robot play sort of a side role and like you cannot, like one, one take a person when they have like 12, 12 to 15 kids, they can't pay attention to all these. Would there be a, uh, that was sort of the premise of this work, would there be a role for a robot to even do something, do, do something useful mm -hmm. and, and, and focusing really on the interpersonal interaction with the kids and not focusing mm -hmm. on the interaction with the robot. But, but what you're describing is kind of what be that's kind of going back to sort of that first question, you know, what, act, what really happens if we bring these robots in? It's like, how does it change if you have this machine in such a settings? How would it change how, how, the, 
how the how the educator the staff are interacting with the kids or with each other and and that, I think that's kind of where it gets really really interesting. This was sort of the first proof of concept question of like does a robot even have the uh, efficacy to to do something change how people interact with, with each other and particularly small children? Yeah, well, thank you for the question. Yes. Yeah, so I have a question. So obviously there's a lot of uh, inspiration from psychology pulled in uh, into your work. Uh, mm -hmm. that sort of animates it. And I wondered, so to what extent, so um, previous work that looked like, especially like in automation, so especially in industrial automation mm -hmm. like in the 70s and 80s, and how that changed workplace dynamics and yeah. control between labor and management and things like that. Um, I guess how much does that sort of factor in? Do, like do you consider that important and relevant to your work? Is that, has that generally been seen as something that's not really connected to what you do? Um, so you're thinking about like the old literature that generally looks more broadly at the effects of, of, of automation coming into 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 work practices. Yeah, because often like back then they didn't call them robots. They didn't yeah. really have robots. They just had machines that were coming in and replacing. Mm -hmm. They weren't considered intelligent, but they did the same jobs mm -hmm. that people did. Yeah. And so is that just not considered relevant because they're not seen as autonomous or? No, I, mean, I, I think it's definitely a question I'm very interested in. I mean, broadly, I'm very interested to draw a lot in my work from the organizational behavior lit literature. I mean, I've not specifically looked at that level broadly about it. It's a societal level. What does it mean when we bring these, these robots into, into workplace case settings? But it's definitely something which is really interesting. Yes? So, um, is there a difference uh, between uh, the robot and the human being? Um, keyboard or if the robot is a heart mm -hmm. um, on the um, effects, um, <coughs> how do they ameliorate um, the teams of that or uh, emotion? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely think there is a huge, huge difference. I mean, all these characteristics, I mean, there's multiple studies that show that all these matters. I mean, even, for example, Leila Takayama's work showed that even if it changes the height of the telepresence robot a little bit, that has an impact on how we perceive it. I mean, adding gaze to a, to a ton of handover studies with the robot arms, uh, and then adding social gaze to it kind of affects how people perceive the handover, but also kind of the performance of it. I think all of these, all of these things immensely uh, matter. But I think also it's like, I mean, I, I, I mean, there's been some, some papers arguing almost that you should, you should always add humanoid features to robots because then it makes them more and more likable. But I think that's a very limited perspective because as soon as you add these features, it creates expert expectations. And, uh, and, and and that's where things can go also terribly, terribly wrong and disappointing and probably harm the overall effectiveness in the in the long term. So I I I kind of I, I think it's just like a very um, on, on a specific basis to decide to what degree do you want to add these, 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 these features. But, but for me, it's also interesting that when we look at, look at um, emotion, I like, I, for example, I don't like that distinction between social robots and, and non-social robots. I think all these robots are to some degree social. Uh, I think it's sort of when we look for the socialness of a robot, we shouldn't look in its features. We should look at it in the in the context, and uh, and, and that this distinction we look at the social robots, we kind of then get the now studies and all this thing, and that misses that. Like yeah, an industrial arm, depending on on what it does and how that's located in sort of the sequence of an interaction, can have really high social implications, and that's something we also right now that I'm pretty curious about, like how these industrial robots. Doing what they do, the simple pick and place, how might they affect kind of even be the personal personal Hey, um, <laughs> so I was intrigued by you know the video you initially showed, right, with the two men interacting and sort of like stepping over the woman's sort of contribution, mm -hmm. right, and then yeah. we tried to replicate that, right. So I was curious to hear from you. Um, given that there were potentially issues of like gender and race, yeah. right, in this dynamic, like what is the, like how do you see that potentially being intensified or alleviated through a robot's intervention, right? Especially given that you know robots are often also associated with sort of masculine enactments yeah. of technology production. So, yeah. what is you know how do you see those issues emerge at the sort of intersection of race and gender? Yeah. 
That's that's a really yeah. I mean, that's a super interesting question. We haven't I haven't looked at that systematically, but we're just sort of uh, starting starting to do that. I mean, I've been looking at more looked a little bit at cultural issues and then how they how they play out in, in these interactions, particularly with telepresence or mm -hmm. robots. But um, yeah, that'd be fun to talk to talk more about. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you're, you're using mostly like Wizard of Oz in these studies, right? Yes, okay. yeah. So these one of these were all Wizard of Oz. Yeah, okay. So one of the things I was curious about in, in sort of your research design process, mm -hmm. like how do you decide kind of, I guess, like how far out to Wizard of Oz, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, so, so like the, the keep on example, right? It seems to be sticking to a fairly rigid script, even though you were Wizard of Oz again, right? So you could have had it saying anything. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do you, how do you find that balance between uh, like how sophisticated you want to imagine the robot could be in the Wizard of Oz process versus what you think might be possible now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like most of the time, we stick to ways for the robot to engage in ways that are Im implementable with some method right now. Like for us, it's mostly the question, not so much about. Uh, it's more the question like, would that even be a route that we should go and spend time on and, and, and effort to develop these things? That's kind of the questions we, we build. But it's always with that, with that sense, with that sense of feasibility. Man. We don't do things that we, we go. like we don't even yeah. No, so like twenty years out. Yeah, you no, exactly. It's like we do more. What do we do a role now to some degree. I mean, I did one study with Cynthia Brazil's group where we used autonomous autonomous systems, and I mean. Tremendous amount of time and work to make these these systems 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 work, and even then, like we had like human in the loop to correct the speech at the time that didn't work so well. I guess now probably you can get them loose by by themselves. But yeah, but the, 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 the we're trying to kind of be really careful about the way we visit robots or robots in a way that we think hey, that's actually doable and fits within the capabilities that are out there right now. So I have a question. So it seems like the teams that you study are like engineering engineering teams, so like the mastermind, so there's kind of like a measurable outcome. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, these robots will be as applicable if it's a team that works on something that is less concrete? Like maybe the outcome of the success of the team is less well defined or less measurable. So like the kind of task that they from engineering or mm -hmm. fixing one, for example. I mean, I think it would still be be, be, be applicable in a, in a sense that we our robots like they don't help on the task like in our interventions the kind of behaviors I'm curious and study always more act on the social interpersonal processes. So in that sense, and I think I think um, that that these social dynamics um, they help you independent of the kind of specific task you're 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 working. Yeah, that's what yep. I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, from the in-lab study of Kibon, yeah. uh, do you have any good sense on what constitutes the authority of the rover? Like, for example, when does it work? When does it not work? Like, do you have any good sense? Like, could you could you explain that? Like, like the, the the how the robot was was like because so in the cases they fail, like if. The robot does not mit uh, mitigate ch uh, the conflict. Mm -hmm. Why? Do you have any sense why it doesn't work? Like, because I could just ignore it and then doesn't listen to robot, for example. Ah, okay. Yeah. Like, if it did not, if it did not work, why? Yeah. What makes it work? Like, what what makes yeah. it? I mean, there's so many things. Like, this is like one study. So many things that were going on, mm -hmm. and partially was like, for example, we needed. We found out we needed to introduce the robot as 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 as, uh, as a mediator. So the robot had kind of an expectation of, of being already in, in in some sense of in it had some 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 authority to it. And kind of it's a question of would that work if that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think kind of that's hard to say based on how early this is. Right. Right. Where where things can fail, and to, what are all the aspects that are necessary to work together to have an effective intervention? Yeah. I think that's about all I've got. Almost a quick question. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. 
Let's give Mother a round of applause.